Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. How do we want every single solitary true crime story to end? With the bad guy in prison, right? We want that satisfying conclusion. We want the people who do these awful things to get what's coming to them. We want them locked away where they can't hurt anyone ever again. We think of prison as the end of the line, final destination. These mighty fortresses where the monsters who commit the acts that terrify us all are kept locked away from the rest of us and that brings us comfort. We are especially comforted knowing that the very worst of the worst sit on death row, behind wall after wall, gate after gate, and that we are safe from them. But what would happen if those criminals, the very worst of the worst, somehow planned and executed an extraordinary escape? What if somehow they freed themselves from their cages and disappeared into our community? Well, as unbelievable and implausible as it sounds, that's exactly what happened. This is the story of the Mecklenburg prison break. Let's get into it. May 31st, 1984. The crown jewel in the Virginia prison system was the Mecklenburg prison. It was completed and opened in 1976 and had cost the state over $20 million to build it. Now, that's $101 million in change in today's cash. This was a very expensive state-of-the-art prison that had all the bells and whistles of the day. The C-Pod in Building 1 was home to Virginia's death row inmates, its most dangerous criminals. There was a double-gated entrance, which is called a sally port. That was the only way in and out of death row. Around 10.30 at night, a call comes over the radio and to the telephone box located inside the sally port. Officer Ron Sawyer answers the call, and it's a guard from inside the prison who tells him that a bomb has been found in C-Pod. The guard on the other end tells Officer Sawyer to get a prison van and bring it to the sally port entrance so that an inside prison bomb squad can bring the bomb to the van and remove it for proper disposal. Officer Sawyer hangs up the phone and runs to get a van. He comes back and rings the gate to be let in. There was a prison policy in place that strictly forbid both gates, the double gates to the sally port, being open at the same time. This is an obvious security measure. If someone were to escape one of the gates, the second gate would be there to keep them inside. However, Officer Sawyer tells the gate operator about the bomb and says that they need to leave both gates open so the bomb squad can get in and out quickly. The operator opens the first gate and then the second and the van pulls inside. The large roll-up door is then lifted and the van backs up to the dock. As soon as the door is up, the bomb disposal team, dressed in EOD protective gear and helmets, comes rushing from the building. One officer runs out first and he is followed by four other officers carrying a large square device on a stretcher, which is emitting a large amount of smoke. A sixth officer is carrying a fire extinguisher and he is spraying the device down as the others carry it. The officers load the device into the back of the van, they jump in and speed out of the double gates. The officers left behind were breathing a sigh of relief, grateful that what could have been a crisis, maybe even a deadly crisis, had been averted by the actions of some brave bomb disposal officers. Except that's not what had just happened, not at all. Just inside the prison walls, six prison guards sat in their underwear, bound and gagged. The six men who had just driven away in the van that looked like prison guard bomb disposal officers they were six death row inmates. Mecklenburg had just lost six of its most deadly prisoners and no one had any idea where they were headed. All of those six men were dangerous, but the most dangerous men in the group were the Briley brothers, James and Linwood, who were the heads of a gang in Richmond, Virginia that was known for being especially violent. James and Linwood Briley were convicted of several murders, but were suspects in 21 murders. They had even killed a pregnant woman and children, elderly people. They were vicious men. They were also men who had nothing to lose, and now they were free. The other four men were Earl Clanton, Derek Peterson, Willie Jones, and Lamb Tuggle. 
All of these men had been convicted of murder. Some of them had killed elderly citizens and retail employees for no reason. These were six very dangerous men who had done terrible things and authorities knew they would not hesitate to kill again in order to stay free. In fact, later on, one of the police officers said, we knew it was gonna be an absolute miracle if we could find all six of these guys and bring them back into custody without anyone getting hurt or killed. But they were definitely hoping for that miracle once they found out what had happened. Let's talk kind of briefly about the conditions in the prison and kind of why this happened. I mean, obviously people want to get out of prison, but there was more to it than that. The death penalty had been suspended nationally from 1968 to 1976. Well, not long after it was reinstated, a very popular inmate named Frank Coppola was executed and this really shook people up. A lot of these inmates figured they were off the hook. They were not going to continue executing people. There was a lot of opposition to the death penalty during this era. The death penalty had only been back in use for eight years at the time of the prison break. Before Frank Coppola was executed in 1982, two years before the escape, there had not been an execution since 1962. So it was a big deal when they executed Frank. And it told the rest of these death row inmates, your time is coming. Now, not only that, but Frank Coppola's execution was botched. When the switch had been thrown to the electric chair, Frank's head and his leg caught on fire and he suffered a really terrible death. Now, I'm not so sure the family of the woman he murdered cared much about that, but the other death row inmates sure did. This escape was pretty ingenious and it was definitely well planned. Two months before the escape, an inmate sent a letter anonymously to the Virginia Attorney General telling him that a bomb was being constructed in Seapod. The letter said this inmate was concerned and wanted authorities to know about the bomb, but he didn't dare tell anyone in the prison for fear of being labeled a snitch. Well, as soon as the warden heard about the bomb threat, he ordered two separate shakedowns. On two different occasions, all of the cells were tossed and security measures were ramped up after that to watch for what might be inmates constructing a bomb. There was no bomb. There was never a bomb. This letter was sent to plant the seed of the bomb in the minds of the people that ran the prison. The inmates wanted the guards and prison officials to have the idea of a bomb already in their minds so they could make this plan of theirs work. So how did this happen? On the days that the death row inmates were allowed out into the gated yard to play basketball, they would be taken out of their cells and led, shackled, to the small fenced-in basketball court where five guards would stand over them and watch as they exercised. On the day they decided to execute this plan, an inmate named Willie Turner and a second inmate approached a couple of the guards and told them they wanted to go back to their cells early. One of them said they had hurt their knee and the other said he really needed to use the bathroom. The guards were not supposed to allow any of the inmates to leave the basketball court without all of the other inmates. Anytime an inmate left, a guard had to go with them. So if two inmates left, that meant two guards had to go with them. But for whatever reason, the guards agree and allow these two prisoners to go back early. That meant that there were now only three guards for all of the inmates left on the basketball court. There were three inmates for each guard at this point, so they were outnumbered three to one. At the end of the allotted exercise period, the guards begin to escort the remaining death row inmates back to their cells. As they walk back, they have no idea that this plan is already in motion. The guards, now outnumbered, don't bother to do a head count as they bring the inmates back from the yard. They come into this small area, it's kind of a reception lobby in the building, and then from that reception area, it branches off into different pods. As they stand in this small area past the first security door, waiting for the second to open, the inmates start to scuffle. They push each other and yell at each other to create a diversion. While the three guards are occupied breaking up the scuffle, Inmate Earl Clanton opens the door to the guard's bathroom that is in this reception area and slips inside. He closes the door behind him and waits for the signal. The guards don't realize that Clanton is gone because it's pretty much chaos at this point and also because they didn't do a head count. The guards then take the remaining inmates back to the day room without realizing they have left one behind, 
hiding in their restroom. After the inmates are back in the day room, a guard goes to use the bathroom, but he finds that the door is locked. He knocks and gets no answer. So he goes to the guard that is working in the control booth that controls the doors into both pods, and he says, hey, the door must be broken. Prison policy dictates that they should have called maintenance at the time, but they didn't. The other thing they were supposed to do that they didn't do was put all of the inmates back in their cells while they unlocked the locked door. And they didn't do that either. So the guard leaves and he just goes to use another bathroom. Then the prison nurse comes into the reception area and she's got a tray with all of the inmates' medication on it. Her normal routine dictates that she goes into the guard's bathroom and uses the sink in there to fill this little plastic water pitcher. And then she pours out of that water pitcher into each one of the medicine cups for the inmates to take their pills. She too finds the door locked. She again tells the guard in the control booth, but this guard does nothing. The nurse then takes the inmates their pills and tells the men they have to take the medication without water. As the nurse hands out the pills, one of the inmates on the second story row of cells calls down and says, come up here, my toilet is clogged and it's flowing all over the ground. This is yet another diversion and two guards go running to the inmate's cell to check the flooding. The nurse finishes dispensing medications to C-Pod and then she goes with another officer who escorts her from C-Pod into another pod in building one. So now we've got two guards checking on the flooding toilet, one guard who has left C-Pod with the nurse, and two guards who are on the second floor finishing up with the inmates that went in early. The guards left in the day room are totally outnumbered at this point. Then the guard in the control booth in the reception area hears someone knocking on the glass and he turns around behind him to see that it is an inmate saying he has a book and he wants to give it to an inmate on the other side of the glass. So the guard is in the center, here's the one inmate and he wants to give the book to a buddy over here on the other side. The guard is not supposed to do things like this and it's against prison policy, but the inmates know this guard and they know his routine and this is part of the plan. So this officer leaves the little control booth and when he does, he does not shut the door all the way behind him. This is something the inmates knew he always did. He didn't want to be bothered with his key. So he props the door open and he walks down the hall to get this book from the inmate and then he's going to take it over to the other side and give it to, to the second inmate. <laughs> I got to keep this all straight. As soon as this officer leaves his control booth, props the door open and starts to walk down the hall to get the book. Earl jumps from the bathroom where he's been hiding and runs into the control booth and shuts the door behind him. As soon as Earl is in the booth, he hits the button that opens all of the doors and all of the inmates come rushing out. Now the day room is completely full of inmates who had previously been locked in their cells and the guards are outnumbered, you know, seven or eight to one. Several of the inmates rush the officer from the control booth, holding homemade knives that had been made and hidden nearby for just this occasion. They grab him and they take him hostage, and the day room erupts into chaos. The guards are quickly overpowered and the inmates begin binding them. Within three minutes, the prisoners have taken control of C-Pod. One by one, they bind the guards with their own handcuffs, they hogtie their legs, and they take their clothes off them. The inmates then blindfold and gag the guards. They take their nightsticks, they take their wallets, their watches, and anything else they can use on the outside. The inmates then force one of the bound guards to call Building 3 and tell the captain to come to C-Pod immediately. They tell the guard to tell the captain that one of the inmates has been injured in an altercation and they also think a guard is hurt. As all of this is happening, the nurse with the medication tray and the guard who is accompanying her come back into the main reception area, but the guard can't find his key. And this is a real guard that has lost his key. I mean, bro, isn't that like most of your job there? But anyway, this is what happened. The nurse and this guard are in a hallway and they can't see what's happening in C-Pod. So this guard walks back into C-Pod not knowing what's going on. Well, he is immediately jumped by an inmate who holds a homemade knife to his throat and he is also taken into their custody and they strip his uniform off of him. The nurse is left in the hallway kind of wondering what's happening. One by one, as guards from other areas of the prison come into C-Pod because they've been called, the inmates attack them, bind them, and take their uniforms. The nurse then gets impatient and she walks out of the hallway where she's supposed to stay until she has a guard, she's a female, in a male prison, and she walks into C-Pod. Well, you can imagine what happened. 
She's jumped by a man wearing a prison guard uniform, but he immediately starts to do things to her and she realizes what's happening. Now, thankfully, as she's being assaulted, other inmates stepped in before a whole lot could be done and stopped that from happening. So now the inmates have eight to 10 guards tied up. And one of the Briley brothers says, we need to kill some of these guys. There's too many of them. But Willie Turner, who is an inmate that was famous for making the weapons, he was most likely the inmate who made all of these weapons, says, we are not killing anybody. He reminded Briley that they agreed no one was going to be killed. Willie Turner wasn't even one of the ones trying to escape, but he probably helped make a lot of the weapons. The inmates now move all of the guards into a janitorial closet and they lock them inside. One of the inmates grabbed a television set off its wall mount bracket and covered it with a blanket brought from a nearby cell. This is what they're going to use to make it look like they have a bomb. The inmates now have to get past the main control room in order to get out of the prison. They take Lieutenant Johnson from the closet and take him to the in-house phone. They force him to call the control room and tell the guard there that another guard is coming to relieve her. Derek Peterson and Earl Clanton, dressed as guards, then headed towards the control room. They are buzzed in and as soon as the door opens, they attack the guard, they bind her and they blindfold her. The inmates then force Lieutenant Johnson to call the main gate. He is the one that calls and alerts the gate that a bomb has been found and they're bringing it out to detonate it. An inmate helping those trying to escape went inside the control room and buzzed the stairwell door open so the inmates could get down the stairs and into the loading dock to wait for the van. The inmates actually knew right where the riot gear was stored, which I find a little strange. As they wait for the van to come around, they go into the closet where the riot gear is stored and they begin putting it on. And with that riot gear are helmets with face shields that hide your identity. They put the television on a stretcher that was used for carrying injured prisoners and they threw the blanket over the top of it and they waited. As soon as the roll-up door opened, they jumped from the prison loading dock with the TV and then they used the fire extinguisher to make it look like it's smoking. They load up their fake bomb, they jump into the van and they drive right off the prison grounds. About 15 minutes after the call had come in to the pod next to C-Pod, to send officers, one of the guards starts thinking something's wrong, they should have come back or we should have heard something by now. So she and a couple other guards go into C-Pod and they see the day room is in shambles. Tables are tipped over, chairs are on end, and a lot of the prisoners are just kind of sitting there looking at them. So they start looking for the guards. A lot of people say that one of the prisoners actually told them where they were and they find these six guards bound in their underwear. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, it's very serious, but it's just like, I mean, it's kind of something out of a movie, right? Well, immediately the prison goes into lockdown. They call the warden who is at home and he comes into the prison, of course, and brings his staff with him. They start interviewing the guards and they're hoping the guards heard something in the escape where the prisoners might've given a clue as to where they're headed. Unfortunately, they said nothing and the guards really have no information. Now, it's worth mentioning that at this time, guards were making $13,000 a year. They're in this maximum security prison working with dangerous people and they're making the equivalent of about $32,000 a year now they're not making any money so of course it dawns on the warden and his staff that you know maybe one of the guards is involved with this but as they interview them the guards are steadfast they didn't know about this they had nothing to do with it they know nothing the warden immediately calls in every helicopter in the state of Virginia. He calls in all of the bloodhounds and he calls in all of the off-duty officers. There are men at this point being called from two and three hours away to get there to the prison as quickly as they could. Some people in the administration in the warden's office later admitted that at first the warden wanted to try to keep this quiet, <laughs> but they quickly realized that wasn't going to happen. So they quickly set up a perimeter around the prison and it's being searched by everyone who can get there. They've got two helicopters up in the air and more are on the way. At first, they're hopeful that they will find the inmates pretty quickly, but after an hour, that hope begins to fade. June 1st, 1984. It is now around two in the morning. The hunt has been in full swing for almost two hours. Despite hundreds of people searching everywhere around the prison, helicopters in the air, scent hounds on the ground, they have found nothing. By this time, the inmates are far from the search area into North Carolina. 
a sheriff deputy actually sees the white prison van pass him. He remembers waving at the officers inside the van who waved back at him and just kept on going. Now, of course, there were no cell phones back then, but why hadn't there been a call out over neighboring states' radios telling them of the prison break? I don't know. I can't answer that. But we do know that this North Carolina officer had no idea that there had been an escape. The inmates realize that they have to get rid of the giant white prison van. They can't keep driving that. It's too conspicuous. They pull the van into a thick grove of trees. They jump from the van and they split up on foot. The Briley brothers, along with Lem Tuggle and Willie Jones, go in one direction. Derek Peterson and Earl Clanton go the other direction. And soon, those two spot some clothes drying on a clothesline, which they take and change into. Not long after they ditch the van, a North Carolina Highway Patrol officer spots it and calls it in. Now, for all their planning, they sure messed this up. The trees the inmates had pulled the van into were on the playground of an elementary school, and it looked very out of place, the van did, sitting there. This was a huge mistake, and it's one that really ended up costing them time. Thank heavens. A call comes into the warden's office back at the prison. A man has been carjacked by two men in uniform about 30 miles south of them in North Carolina, and this lets the Virginia officials know the men have gone south. Police then rushed to a motel in North Carolina and set up a command center, and once they had a location to work from, they called in the FBI. Robert Pence from the Charlotte FBI was put in charge of the quickly formed task force, and the search continues. Officers are going door to door in the area, checking backyards and sheds anywhere someone could hide. They start going through the prison phone records, listening to calls the inmates had made before escaping. They also started trying to locate the relatives of each inmate to see if they knew anything. Then they had to alert the public. People were shocked to hear on the morning news that six death row inmates had escaped from prison, this new state-of-the-art prison, and were free in their area. The public has every reason to be concerned. A man calls the police and tells them that his pickup truck has been stolen from his yard. An APB is put out for the pickup that has personalized license plates, making it easier to spot. People in the area begin loading their guns. They're picking their kids up from school instead of letting them walk. And a new perimeter was set up around Warrington, North Carolina. Roadblocks are put up on each and every road and all drivers are stopped and questioned. Helicopters continue to search from the sky and even more tracking dogs are brought in. And the media starts calling the escapees the Mecklenburg Six. At this point in time, our uh, primary concern is the uh, recapture uh, of the inmates who are at large at this point. And we are cooperating with uh, the FBI, with North Carolina, uh, with uh, a number of other uh, authorities. Uh, in an effort to do that. Derek Peterson and Earl Clanton walk into a North Carolina laundromat. They are hungry and thirsty, and they had spent part of the money they'd stolen from one of the guards on a bottle of wine and some cheese at a convenience store. Just as Derek and Earl pull out some chairs in the laundromat to sit down and drink their wine, a police officer drives by and spots them in the window. This officer sees that one of the men is wearing a coat that looks like a prison guard's coat. So the officers pull up to the laundromat, remove their weapons from their holsters, and rush into the laundromat. Derek and Earl put their hands up and turn to the wall, cussing, obviously angry that they've been caught. They had only been out of prison for 19 hours. They didn't even get to drink their wine or eat their sweet, sweet freedom cheese. <laughs> the men were taken into custody and placed in the county jail just a block away from where they were caught. June 2nd, 1984. The hunt continues and intensifies. The news reported on the Briley brothers' crimes. They had killed many people, children, pregnant women, and the public was terrified. A woman reports seeing the men at a campground, so then officers are sent there, but they don't find anything. And then forest rangers join in with county employees and regular citizens. Anybody who could help was called to help. People that owned boats were asked to put their boats in the water and begin patrolling up and down the waterways. This was a massive hunt that lasted all day and into the evening. 
Reports begin to pour in from all over the county and the governor of Virginia puts out notice that there is a $40,000 reward for any of the inmates' capture. At 10.45 that night in Portsmouth, Virginia, two cops see a couple of guys in a parking lot trying to break into a car. They roll up on these two guys who initially put their hands up, but then they pull out a gun and start shooting at the officers. The officers return fire, and as the men run away, one of the officers realizes they are the Briley brothers. He recognizes them. Unbelievably, the Briley brothers slip away from the police. Back at the prison, authorities are calling all the numbers the Briley brothers had called from prison, and they realized that a lot of those calls had been placed to their uncle in North Philadelphia. At this point, they send officers to stake out this uncle's house, and they also put a tap on his phone line. They knew the Briley's didn't have time to get to Philadelphia yet, but they thought they might be headed there. Four days go by, and then five. Soon it's a week, and then 10 days. During that time, the Briley brothers had split up with Lem Tuggle and Willie Jones. Lem and Willie have made their way to North Vermont, just south of the Canadian border. The men had been camping out in the woods and they had decided they were going to try and cross into Canada, but there's a problem. They're out of money and they're almost out of gas in the stolen pickup truck. Lem Tuggle gets into the truck and he drives into a souvenir shop in town. He pulls out a knife and demands all of the money in the cash register from the owner. And then that owner, the woman, takes down the license plate of the truck and calls the police. Lem drives away, headed back towards his campsite to pick up Willie Jones, but he doesn't know the police have already been called. As Lem drives, an off-duty police officer and an on-duty police officer begin to follow him. The two officers come upon Lem in the truck and one drives up ahead and pulls his car out into the road. Pretty brave of him considering who's driving that truck. He gets out and he positions himself with his rifle and he waits to see if Lem is just going to drive right into him. Fortunately, Lem does not do this. He pulls over and surrenders without incident. He is taken into custody after 10 days on the run. The very next day, Willie Jones called the Vermont State Police and told them, this is Willie Jones. I escaped from prison in Mecklenburg and I want to turn myself in. He gave his location to the operator and just sat there and waited on the side of the road while the cops came and got him. Willie was hungry and tired and he was apparently covered in bug bites and he'd had enough. The crazy thing is, is if Willie had just walked five miles north, he would have made it into Canada. Now they have only the Briley brothers left to capture, but these are who they consider to be the most dangerous of all the inmates. Lem Tuggle, who is now in custody, is talking. He tells the police that the Briley brothers were with him and Willie Jones until they got to Philadelphia. The Briley brothers then stayed in Philly and he and Willie continued north towards Canada. Authorities then knew the Briley's were in Philadelphia somewhere. Now remember, they've staked out this uncle's house that is very close to these brothers. A few days later, the Briley brothers' uncle leaves the house and the police follow him. He heads towards a body shop where other family members of the Briley's work. The owner of the body shop arrived and opened up the shop for the day and before long there was kind of a group of men hanging around and talking in the shop. As the police sit across the street and watch, they are pretty sure that two of the men are the Briley's but they can't be sure. So they send in an informant, someone from the neighborhood that knew the Briley's, and then he reports back to them that James is there, but he didn't see Linwood. So now the police have to decide whether or not they're going to arrest James or wait and try to get them both, and they decide they're going to wait. Later that night, a group gathered at the body shop. They were hanging out in the parking lot, smoking and drinking and talking to women, and then they see him. Linwood walks up, and now they've got both Linwood and James in their sights. The surveillance teams decide it's time to make their move. They come from their vehicles, guns drawn, and swarm the body shop. James and Linwood Briley drop to their knees, put their hands in the air, and are taken into custody. 19 days after the Mecklenburg Six escaped from death row in a maximum security prison, they have all been recaptured. Isn't that wild? They were all recaptured and all without incident. They didn't hurt anybody. It's really kind of amazing. The nationwide manhunt was over. All of the escapees were returned to Mecklenburg and put back on death row. Five guards were fired and the warden and his assistants were suspended without pay. An independent consultant was brought in and returned a report stating Mecklenburg was dangerous and poorly managed. 
Two months later, there was a massive prison riot at Mecklenburg. Guards were stabbed and inmates were injured. After that, the prison director resigned and new policies were put into place and the executions began. Linwood Briley was executed first on October 12, 1984, just months after being returned to death row. Before his death, he said, at least I had my 19 days. Six months later, on April 14, 1985, Earl Clanton was executed, and just four days after that, on April 18, James Briley goes to the electric chair. Derek Peterson was next, electrocuted in August of 1991. Willie Jones went after that, executed in September of 1992. And finally, Lem Tuggle went last, taking his final walk on December 12, 1996. The prison operated until 2012 when it was closed because it had deteriorated and because newer prisons had taken its place. The prison was demolished in 2017 and the land it sat on now sits vacant. The state of Virginia plans to use it for some kind of an industrial purpose in the future. The escape of the Mecklenburg Six shocked and terrified the country. It shook people who thought the prison, especially a maximum security prison, especially death row inside a maximum security prison, was the place that we could send the worst of the worst to keep them locked away for good. And this was a good reminder that where there is a will, there is usually a way. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Like the video if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to support me. It helps a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.